Yeah, so so we caught the live, I think while it was live stream, Sonetta Studios right here. I just want to say this for some Vinai audience, for some of my audience. Um, <laughs> I, get, I get what ones and ones have said when I pointed to another, I think another debate or another topic that had come up on, I think, Sonetta Platform, Sonetta Studios, House of Consciousness on that particular platform. Now I think they call it Welcome to the Big Leagues. So, um... Yeah, so we're not a fan, you know, we're not a fan of no man, or rather, yeah, no, fan means fanatic. So we're not a fan, but at the same time, right, we are not just going, you know, like when we need to speak out about certain behaviors, misbehaviors, points, mispoints, or certain things, we'll speak out about that. But um, I must admit that with some of the subject matters regarding some of the topics in the Bible. Maybe I disagree with how some of the presenters may have presented their argument for or against, right? But I do give thanks for the um, for the presentation of the platform. I want to make that very clear so that when something else comes up and we happen to be a little more critical, right? Even ad hom hominetical, <laughs> Ad homonyms, ad hominetical. Ad hominem is like when you're against a particular man. You know, you're against a person. You're not just talking, you know, against another person's point, but you actually are making, you know, personal um, statements. This is what uh, Chris Harris, you know, Chris Harris basically was saying concerning Zion Lex that, oh, a lot of ad hominem attacks, so forth and so on, so forth. I wouldn't really consider them so much ad hominem attack. So it wasn't against him just personally. It was against his um, his so-called type of scholarship or pseudo type of scholarship. Are you talking about Horace or, or what is it? Did he said Horace or Sara. He said Haru or somebody. I think he said Horace on the on the horizon. Remember, as I was listening, I made a little joke. I said, "Yeah, you know, some people just die on the horizon. Just because you're on the horizon doesn't mean you're rising." <laughs> You know, you could be on the horizon. Something could be on the horizon. That's like a twilight zone. In a twilight zone. And in this the particular debate, um, from what we heard, and I think we heard the majority, the most of this particular debate, it, it was tight and right in many ways. Like how it was conducted, even how Sarnetta, you know, as the, um, the moderator, the host, how he conducted this particular debate. This is why even the scripture says that open rebuke is better than secret love because there's been a lot of open rebuke especially in the black sphere social media conscious black conscious and media the the problem for most of our people is the same thing that the torah says same thing that the scripture says right i would say tanakh but i'm about to do a video another video we did s some videos on this previously or at least we discussed this particular subject matter why that's all fake i know a lot of people do refer to the Old Testament, the Brit HaYeshana, is one way of referring to the Brit HaYeshana as being um, the Tanakh. But that's a pseudo, that's all pseudo right there. So we're going to pick up on that, you know, as we move forward. That was what we heard in a previous debate. Now, with all of this kind of little bit of an intro right here, a little bit of uh, this vlog foreplay, so to speak, just putting things into context. The subject matter here was was the transatlantic slave trade foretold in the Bible, according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 68. This seems to be the point that Chris Harris, I think Horace on the Horizon or something like that. Yeah, that's that's his group or whatnot. Horace on the Horizon. Yeah. So um, this is the subject matter. And he kept saying, well, stick to, he kept asking, well, what is the topic, the subject of the debate? What is the subject of the debate? Because he was trying to allude or insinuate that um, Achshali, Achshalanu, Abdiel Ben Lewi, you know, that our brother uh, Zion Lex, you know, he was trying to insinuate that um, he was going off of the subject matter. No, I think Zion actually conducted himself pretty well here. Sometimes, yes, our brother does get turned up. We've seen that in some debates, even we were saying, well, we was really rooting. Not rooting, but like, yeah, you're on that point. I think when he was talking with the other brother that was going into some of the speculative, grammatical, um, 
speculations about, you know, this verse here. I forget the brother's name right now. You know, in that particular debate, he he went off on, I think, some people in the audience and looking at the, the, the comments. And even once again, Sonetta said, you know, don't look at the, you know, the peanut gallery. <laughs> not, not the peanut gallery, but the comments, you know, because it could be like the peanut gallery sometimes. People just can say whatever in the comment area and kind of take you off, right? Take you off of what you are saying and what you are presenting. But to this particular point, Zion Lex, um, he presented in our view, and of course, ones like Chris Harris may say, because we are like a so-called co-religionist or, you know, we are co-believer. Or we also ascribe to the same, you know, Hebrew, Israelite and black Jewish or Yehudi identity. You know what I mean? So therefore, we're going to say that. No, nah, not so. In fact, among, um, when I say real mature Hebrews, Israelites, and we, the black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah, the tribe, tribe is a people, the tribe of Judah. Actually, in our Torah observing discipline, this is what we go through. A lot of ones may not recognize that because they have not really kind of come in from the cold, come in to that particular environment, right? Where like iron sharpen, iron sharpeneth iron. Right. So where we are kind of used to that more vigorous, kind of a vigorous discussion and reasoning on the Torah. I mean, this is what's in another area of our history and of our, um, you could say, past that's so misunderstood when, when people talk about the Talmud. You know, the Talmud and the Mishnah and the Gemara. But this is not the subject matter right here. Let's get into this right here. So. We're going to start this out actually by addressing some of the, the topical themes that we heard and just kind of reference, right? Maybe later on we'll take a portion of the clip, but we don't want to get into taking ones and ones clips, the audios and all of that. And then people, you know, we're already taking this particular still right here just to use it as a kind of a point of reference for our audience. What are we talking about and why we're talking about this? Well, we're talking about this because we've already been speaking about the main elements here. First of all, yes, we call it the transatlantic slave trade. But did you know at the time, and we mentioned this before in numerous other videos and reasonings and on the podcast, at the time, the Southern Atlantic Ocean was known as the Ethiopian Ocean, it was known as the Ethiopian Ocean, right? We, we could study the maps, maps going all the way back to whether the 1600s and some in the 17th and the 18th. You know, the centuries and the hundreds, you know, back in that time, nearly 400 years ago, right, the Southern Atlantic Ocean. So it wasn't really the transatlantic. So what, what is, what's been done, what they call it um, anachronistic, anachronistic, is that later on, right, later on as the Gentiles or the Anglo-Europeans and the Anglo-Americans, the Gentiles, as they started to rearrange right rearrange the world right the world system this new world this new world order when we say new world order we're not talking about what is coming allegedly but what already has come vis-a-vis -vis 1776 that particular sense of the new world order right the times of the gentiles in other words to put it in political terms the times of the nation states right this is when we study the torah and zion lex is correct with this the Hebrew and the language and linguistics is very, very important. The linguistics is very important because there's, there's questions and arguments that we have heard made against some of the primary truths of the Bible. And many of them have been very convincing and are convincing from the point of view that we hear them. But then when you actually go into the, the primary um, references, and now here's that, that's the next point that deals with like primary references. The point about Moses writing and getting into like the strong concordance. A couple of questions I like to really ask or reason with um, Zion Lex, right? Come make I and I reason, like just reason on this. You know, what was, what did he mean by this? We do understand the general sense of it, but what did he mean by saying that Moses, well, Moses didn't write it. I think it's because about, there was a quote where it said about book that, Chris Harris pointed to in Deuteronomy written in the book or something like that one of the quotes in the Torah 
first five books of Moshe, the Pentateuch, that talk about book. And Zion Lex, Abdiel Ben Lewi, right, he went in to explain, his Hebrew name, Abdiel Ben Lewi, he went in to explain that, well, that particular word has different, you could say, nuances. And then he mentioned about how the Strong's Concordance is not that reliable or has many errors within it. Well, I would say most of these resources, you know, it's like if we put them on a scale and do a percentage, we, this is where we're going. This is where we're headed. This is the good news for we, the so-called black peoples over here, especially in the Americas and the Caribbean. We see we black peoples over here, especially in the Americas and the Caribbean, as a peculiar, a particular people. Right? And this is why from a scriptural, biblical, my prophetic point of view and when we say prophecy we're connecting the history this is what Zion Lex did very well pointing to some of the books the black Jews of Africa and other documents from Babylon to Timbuktu which um, pseudo scholar like Chris Harris totally dismissed you know when he said that you know it, it was garbage or it was it was it was inaccurate or whatever like that but as Zion already mentioned right he's only pointing to certain of the research that backs up his preconceived his preconceived notion but the key is the language the key is the linguistic this is what i want to stick to right here the key is the language the important point is the language right a lot of things get lost in translation the points concerning the strongs concerning whether moses wrote it these are some of the points that had come up that we said we were going to seek to readdress we'll hopefully take that up elsewhere Right? But the main point right here is the importance of the linguistics, the importance of the language. Can I share with you right here a particular script, uh, a scripture to just point out, to zoom in on the key of the language? Was the transatlantic slave trade foretold in Deuteronomy? So Chris Harris' point that he brought out, or the point that he was seeking to make, was that it's not prophecy. Asar, Asar Hadan, or one of these um, Assyrian Far East, you know, not, not Far East, but we'll say Eastern, right, in that particular region of the world, um, legal codes, a vassal, like a vassal, a vassal, vassals like, like, like fiefdom. So what he was pointing out is like, it's the same way they would write like a master servant, like a master servant agreement. And Zion pointed out correctly that, well, in the context of the time, right? When we say master and servant in the Bible, it doesn't say master or masa and slave. The word slav, slave, does not appear in the Bible. Truly, it's a mistranslation. It's a pseudo translation. The word slave in the KJV Bible is a pseudo translation. Let me just pause on this for a moment right here because as we go through the vid, um, the Ruach Adosh, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, often reveals, right? And it says, Open thy mouth, the real opening of the mouth. We have, you know, Torah wise, right? And so, Yeah, 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 yeah. You just had to just had to pause that. Had to pause that for a moment. Just write that down. Just take note of that. Your slave um, in the KJV Bible is a pseudo translation. Like when ones and ones say trans, right? Transatlantic. At Atlantic. So what we're speaking about here, right, is something that is transactional. Right? Transaction. Right? Transactional. Right, transactional across from here to there, and the body of water, right, the South Atlantic, Atlantic at that time was known as right as the Ethiopic or the Ethiopian, Ethiopicus, Oceanus, Oceanus in the Latin, Oceanus, Ethiopicus, right, was known as or simply translated as the Ethiopian, right, ocean. Now, that in itself should be a point of scholarly discussion in the black conscious community, don't you think? Don't you think the fact that it wasn't, right, there was no uh, transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade should more correctly be known and called the trans-Ethiopian 
right? Or even Ethiopic in one of the ways that it has come out in translation, right? Ethiopic, right? When you understand the linguistics of the language, you know, Ethiopicus, Ethiopicus, right? This is one way of referring to like the Ethiopian, right? So the, we have on the west coast of Africa, right? What's called today Africa, even this term Africa, Africa is also a pseudo term. So what we have among pseudo scholars is a lot of pseudo terminologies and a lot of um, anachronistic, right? Anachronistic um, thinking, right? A lot of an anachronistic thinking. And anachronistic, simply put, is like out of the time, outside of the time, right? So in other words, it's like, okay, you see, today we have like Brooklyn, right? Like Brooklyn, Brooklyn over here in the New York area, Brooklyn, right? You have Brooklyn, or they used to call it Kings, Kings County, right? Kings County, right? And this is when the Europeans came over here, the Dutch and others and the English and so on. And they, and they settled over here, the Yorks, the Lancasters, the, the War of the Roses and all that. So they came over here and they settled over here and they named places from the previous names of the places that they were over in Europe. Right. So an anachronistic example would be like saying that um, before, like the white man came to America, there were American Indians living in Brooklyn. So if I say there were American Indians living in Brooklyn, wait, hold on for a moment. That's before the white man came over here and named it Brooklyn. So whatever that place was that's called Brooklyn today was actually called something else then. This is the very same point that we are making. And so much confusion can be avoided. So once we start to deal with the terms, so we have to deal with terms and terminologies, right? Terminology, right? And some people say, well, this is just semantic, right? You're just dealing with semantics. And I'm saying to them that you're just dealing with academic, right? Your argument is academic. That's to say, it's just a basic it's, it's a basic argument, nothing heavy. It's just an academic argument. But semantics are not just academic. Semantics go far beyond that. You know what I mean? It's like, I call you out of your name. That's not your name. I can't say, oh, you're still with semantics. I call you fool. But your name is, is, is Chris, you know, or Mike, or Jack, or John, or whatever. And, and I call you out of your name. I, I say fool, and you say, don't call me out of my name. And I say, well, you're a fool. You're a fool. And then you say, no, that's not my name. It's ad hominem attack. And I say, oh, you're just being semantics. You're playing semantics here. Whether I call you Chris or I call you fool, you know what I mean? It's the same thing. You know what I'm saying? So using a term outside of the historical context. And this is where... Even the scripture prophesies or, or it forth tells, it foretells, right? It foretells us, right, that they shall seek to change times and laws. Now, once you're changing times and laws, is also linking to rewriting history. So a lot of recent history has been rewritten. So it also de depends on what sort of sources. So ones go to the later day scholarly sources, a lot of later day scholarly sources. You know, so they say, well, the present scholarly consensus, I heard Garfield talking about this. He, he goes along, whatever the, 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 the scholarly con consensus is. So that means whatever these other scholars, maybe more so-called real scholars, right, are doing or whatever they agree with, Right? It affects these pseudo-scholars. So that means these pseudo-scholars, they, they are handicapped. Because at least the other scholars, right, they have access many times to the maybe original reference, primary sources. Many of them have some linguistic uh, capacity. Right? Even when Brother Abdil Ben Levi, when, when Zion Lex asked Chris Harris what language he speaks, he said only English. Now I know this makes a lot of people feel bad. This makes a lot of pseudo scholars feel bad. And Zion, I think you probably know this, a lot of ones are really upset and vexed because there are some ones and ones in the community that do have the linguistic ability. 
and even from a new covenant perspective, Brit Hadasha perspective, if you look at the whole gift of the Holy Spirit that's found in the New Testament, you know, scriptures or the New Testament of the Bible, you'll find that the gift of the Holy Spirit wasn't for them just to jibber jab and just talk nonsense, or as some people would say, it wasn't for them just to just talk to God, you know, as it were, but it was for them to be able to communicate, right, as Yehudi, as, you could say, as Jews, as Judahites, right, and as Israelites and as Hebrews, although they were scattered in various different countries and nationalities and spoke different, it's like we black people today. There's some black people over here today, most, most of us under the English, right, up here in America under the English, right, and in the Caribbean, the Caribbean, Caribbean, the Trans-Ethiopian Ocean, right, in the Caribbean under the British, most of us only really speak probably one language. You notice that? Those of us who have come under the so-called Anglo-Americans tend to only speak one language. Yet, if we study Anglo-American literature and colonization and, and exploration and archaeology, we'll find out that even amongst them, they have scholars amongst them right, that are multilingual. Right, multilingual and have researched and studied ancient languages. And these are many of the sources and resources that many of us, at least initially, had to and do rely upon as a point of reference until we can get up our linguistic weight. And this is the same thing goes with Kemet too. We talk about Kemet or Mitzrayi. Also, there were some points made about Mitzrayi, right? And the fact that it's Mitzrayim, and that's a proper locative noun, so forth and so on. Yes, that's true, but that's not all that is there. Maybe in this respect is what Abdiel was saying concerning Zion, was saying concerning um, the, the uh, strong concordance, right? But even the strong concordance that we have in these softwares and in the Blue Letter Bible, that we're, we're one of the first that had started to recommend to other Hebrews and Israelites the Blue Letter Bible about maybe 20 or something years ago. We're just going to say that, put that there on the record, because I have to say, give thanks. Many, many more are beginning to use that, but they're thinking that that alone is the end all and be all. Give thanks, Zion Lex. It's not. It's just a stepping stone. Because even Chris Harris asked you, well, why did you have to use, you know, well, well you use uh, the strong concordance. Yeah, but he also speaks, studies, and teaches Hebrew and practices this way, right, which is primary point of reference is the Hebrew. Now, he made some flimsy arguments about Hebrew, and a lot of this comes from a lot of the pseudo scholarship that comes out from the academics and, and the latter day consensus. And the reason why you find many of the latter day scholars, and this is where a lot of the ones who are coming against us within the so called black conscious community and others, they're going to a latter day, a lot of latter day so called scholarship to try to dismiss the earlier scholarship. A lot of the earlier scholarship, I'm talking about earlier scholarship over 100 and maybe 200 years or even earlier than that, was pointing to significant um, evidence and sometimes overtly stating exactly what we're stating, that the black people, we black and brown people, are original Hebrews and Israelites and of the tribe of Yehuda, of the tribe of Judah. Now, these terminologies also need to be understood in their context. This is why, once again, language, as Gormawi, Karmawi, Haile Selassie, Gormawi, Nagus, Neges, Right, the king of kings, right? the king of kings of Ethiopia says to I and I, I and I is a Rastafari, a Rastafari Jew, a Rastafari Yehudi. As he says to I and I, he says, language is the key of culture. Have you heard this before? Language is the key of culture. A lot of people say about learning culture or getting culture or culture this, culture that, but language, language is the key of culture. When I first heard this, it was amazing, something I heard, but over the years, I put this to the test scientifically. It's observable, it's testable, it's repeatable objectively, but also subjectively. But to make these sort of points that must be made, we should make them from an objective perspective. So in this particular debate, Zion Lex, yes, he did address Chris. He did a, he, he addressed Chris, the Chris Harris mentality. 
right? The Chris Harris, it's obvious that Chris Harris is a knowledgeable brother, a brethren, we can even say, you know, in grace, right? A knowledgeable brother. And even it seems as though what he was saying that even he himself either believed at one time, right? And then perhaps started to read or study other things. And in our opinion, he has gotten deceived, right? But doesn't mean that the information necessarily was deceptive, but it's also one's point of point of view, right? One's point of view, one's subjective point of view. And this came out and Zion, I think, really hit on it when he was saying that it's not a real scholarly debate because scholars sometimes can acknowledge even in a debate against their opponent where the opponent makes some very good points. And within the debate, they might even address some of those points and even make their point within acknowledging or deferring to the point that the, their opposition has made. But in the one side, it's subjective, right? Subjective. Um, type of thing ones don't do that you know what I mean they just use everything to try to make their particular point right and even dismiss and don't address the points that are made even to their point because sometimes person make a point next person make a point and then you expect them to be discussing the points made not one person make a point and you're like oh, that's a very good point I wonder what this other person is going to say and the other person doesn't even address it doesn't even acknowledge the person even said anything about it, you know, and then it becomes like each one is just talking out their own point and they're not really engaging, right, engaging each other. So on a certain level, we even see, you know, at least in this particular instance, Sarnetta even shows a certain amount of growth right here where he even reminds ones, you know, about certain particular, well, this is what we're talking about. Now, the, what it was talking about was whether it was prophecy. Deuteronomy 28:68. Chris Harris says no. It was not prophecy. It was just like a vassal contractual agreement. Esar Hadan. He brings up this particular document that kind of shows that it's written in the same style, so forth and so on. Well, this is like me saying right now, you speaking English. Every thing that you're saying is not even your own. You've just taken all of that from the white man. It's like saying to one of my brothers, because they disagree with we being Hebrews, Israelites, a Torah, whatnot, right? And they're speaking to me in English and they only know English, English only. And I'm saying, well, you see, everything that you're saying come from the white man. And he said, why you say that? Because you're speaking English. You don't speak any other language. You don't speak no black African language, no Kemetic language, none of that. So everything you're saying, everything you write, everything you talk about, you talk about in English and you got that from the white man. So it's not even you talking. The white man has his hand up your backside and he's puppeting you. You're sitting on his lap and he's puppeting you. Now, is that genuous or disingenuous? Is that ingenuous, genuous, ingenuous or disingenuous? Which one is it? Some will say that's a disingenuous argument right there. So you're saying because somebody is talking English, that means that everything that they are saying, they don't have any original ideas because it's not their original language. Remember, they're from Africa. You're from Africa. You're from West Africa. So you should be speaking the West African language. You're going to say, well, because of the captivity, being kidnapped and slavery, they took this from us, so forth and so on. Well, then... Why don't you learn the language? Well, you don't know because they hid the records. They don't know. You don't know where you really came from. You know, you came from Africa. You did a DNA test and they say your bloodline is some of the people in West Africa. So why don't you learn? Why don't you go back and why don't you learn that? How can I believe anything you say? Because you're saying everything in English. You're not speaking any other language. So when we're looking at even a New Testament of the Bible, there are some who say, well, it's in Greek. Some even allege Right, that the, the Greeks invented the term Hebrew because Hebrew in the Hebrew doesn't have, doesn't begin with an H. And I will even prove to you that they are wrong. The first mention of Hebrew, of Hebrew as Hebrew as we use Hebrew in the Bible is where Abram, Abraham called Abram, Abram, Abram is called ha Ibri, ha Ibri, Habri. Ha-ibri, habri, habri, Hebrew, Hebrew, habri. So it doesn't come from Greek. 
It doesn't come from Greece. See, you don't even know who the Greeks are. Y'all who be telling this Greek stuff, you don't know who the original Greeks are from who the, the later day Greeks are. The original Greeks were the Ionian people, the Javanite people, Javan. You remember Javan? You can find him there as well as in the genealogical charts that people go to, you know, for the table of nations, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, or Ham, Shem, and Japheth, as ones will say, you know, in the early, the first book of Moshe, Hebrew book that's known as Genesis or Bereshi, I think around chapter 10 and around chapter 11. And particularly start out with chapter 10 you'll find Javan and it connects with the Isles of the Gentiles so Javan in ancient Egypt on the walls is known as the Keftiu the Keftiu now all of this we can substantiate with facts and proof we're given at least the wise the heads up on this Keftiu look up Keftiu K-E-F-T-I-U Egypt right Egypt and maybe you could put Greek or Greece there because many ones and ones have brought it out more about 20 years ago many ones and ones were not really only the higher scholars were on that but now it's become a little more distributable that ones actually are able to make connections based on ancient Egypt ancient Kemet ancient Mitzrayim that mouthpiece for Ethiopia, for the continent, what's called Africa, right? Find that we have the Keftiu people who in European scholarship is known as the Minoans, the Minoan people or the Ionian people, the Ionian. That's when, when you hear one say that the original Greeks were black people as well as the original Romans. See what the European or the white, the white people did. Let's put in these terms right here because this basically helps us to describe who we're talking about from today's view into the past time, right? They did the same thing they did in, in, in America. The same thing they did, did in, in, in Australia. Same thing they did in the Caribbean, where they drive out or they subdue, right, the native people and take over their land, right? And then they rename the places in their land. We see this in Australia. We see this in South Africa. We see this all over the world. We're in the times of the Gentiles. And the connection of the times of the Gentiles, I keep emphasizing the times of the Gentiles because it's times of the nation states. A way of explaining the Gentiles to the nation states. If you understand the scientific um, political term of nation states, we're talking about a real thing. It's because of the nation states that we have 54, 55, 50 something states in Africa, how they carved up Africa. The nation states it was the Berlin Conference. So when you see Africa divided into all these artificial borders, think of nation states. Before these artificial borders, what were the borders? That's the question. Before the artificial borders, what were the borders and boundaries? Think about the confusion. The white man decided to draw on, on a map and say, this is yours, this is mine, when they carved up Africa, right? And they divided peoples, right, that were one people because of their artificial maps. So think about by doing this, the confusion that it has caused even for many of the real Latter-day scholars. See, it's the scripture in the Bible, the Hebrew scripture in the Bible from Old Testament to New, of all the other, you could say religions, mythologies, ideologies, that gives us a consistent view. People always ask and say, well, where's the primary document? Where's the document that Moses wrote down way back when? Like they really expect a scroll or a parchment with a people that were a living people who still are a resurrecting people now, but a living people that they're going to have this particular scroll. See, why do we have it in Egypt? Because Egypt is a dry ass country. It's hot, it's dry, everybody knows things can be easily preserved. A lot of things was buried under the sand for years and years. And it's only because of the Bible that Egyptology and this interest in Egypt even exists. In other words, it's only because of the Bible. It's only because of the Hebrew Bible, right? Egyptology, what, 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 Kemetics, Kemetism, the Kemet, Kemetism, that's what they call it, Kemetism. Can we call it Kemetism or Egyptology? Only exists today because of the Bible. 
if you really understand the history the history of how we get here, how they discovered things and before everything was buried under the sand and nobody knew where anything was, why were they even interested in digging up under all that sand? Most of that was under sand. See, you go to Egypt today and they've been doing a lot of work year by year, right? And digging up and amateur archaeologists going on digs and coming back there year after year and kind of all contributing. All the nations are contributing to dig up what some of y'all Right? And also some of us know is our ancient, you could say ancient culture, ancient Egypt. So all the other nations are involved in these digs. How many of y'all Kemetic um, scholars and priests and others are involved in that? Why don't you get involved in that? Why don't you get involved in that? Right? Get involved in that. Be on, be on the front lines firsthand. We know that there are a few. There was one particular, I think, black man and his daughter that a lot of people was talking about a couple of years ago who had discovered some things and who was over there digging up stuff. For the point is that all of that was buried under the sand and was not known, right? Only a few things was peeking up from the sand. I mean, even, even the pyramid was not as visible then, right? And we're talking about over a period of a thousand plus years, right? As it is today. Right. And that's because somebody knew that Egypt, it was Egypt. Egypt was over here. It was a great kingdom. E, you know, the Bible, the Israelites, the Israelites in the Bible, the Israelites in Egypt, the God of Israel, the one who brought them out of the land of Egypt, 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 Egypt. And so the white man being under, you say, Christianity by and large, right, came across that over and over Old Testament and New Testament. The children, and remember the white man was believing that he was the Israelite. I'm talking about the European Christian white man, right? Was believing, not the, the other European, right? Um, Jewish white man, right? Who, according to the best research, 740 AD is when they converted or adopted Judaism. 740 AD. I want you to mind that number right there. 740 AD. So the Jews that we know of as Jews that are not black, right, that are called Jews are the white European, Eastern European Jews. And they, of all the white people that claim to be Jews, have the oldest, right, you say, history or tradition, right, with some evidence that proves it. But it only dates back to 740 AD. That means that, well, there's people before then, right, before then, who were Jews. And this is what Zion Lex brought out very well in his rebuttal, right, to the Chris Harris point. Don't they make these silly points like, did anybody come off the boat, you know, saying, I'm a Hebrew, I'm an Israelite? Well, did they cross the Atlantic Ocean when it wasn't named the Atlantic Ocean at the time? Did they cross the Atlantic? We, we got maps that the mariners, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the seamen or the, you know, <laughs> that they use, the navigators used to come over to the Americas in the West and even to go to Europe, remember the triangle, the triangle of trade and all of that, you know. But they keep calling it the transatlantic. See, that's the first point that's wrong because here we're going to link it to a bigger picture and Zion Lex did mention, you know, the Beta Israel, you know, of Ethiopia and other places in Africa as well. But here we have to stick with the Ethiopia point because the Ethiopia point is also going to be an important link with the linguistic point concerning these primary or old ancient writings, right? That's outside of the purview of European scholarship. Because European scholarship often alludes to the Ethiopian, the Ethiopic documents and the Ethiopic testimony being very ancient. And we know that even white European Jews have invested a lot of time, a lot of resources in investigating. And people say, well, where's the primary documents? Here's the question I say, where is the Beta Israel, so-called Falasha, they call them Falasha, but where's the Beta Israel manuscripts that they took from the Beta Israel during one of those operations where they brought the Beta Israel to the state of Israel, right? They brought them to the state of Israel and they had one plane, two planes, 
right? One plane had all the people, right? The next plane had all their manuscripts. When the two planes landed, they took all the manuscripts to Hebrew University and other sites in the state of Israel and buried them in their sub subterranean, you know, subterranean chambers, right? For their research. And they gave the Ethiopian um, Jews, the Ethiopian Yehudi, the Beta Israel, they gave them all these other documents, you know, all these later day Jewish, you know, Masoretic and other Jewish documents, right? We're not dismissing them, but they took from them all of their ancient manuscripts. They made sure that, hey, we're going to get you out of here, take all everything you got, all those ancient scrolls. They're thinking that, oh, we're going to be able to have access to it. To this very day, the Beta Israel, by and large, have no access to thousands of manuscripts. You see, that's also the key with the question about Hebrew. What language was Moses speaking? That then answers, that's another question. So it's because they take Ethiopia out of the equation and because some black Hebrew Israelites, right, under a, a part of the doctrine that has been counterfeited and frauded by some of the latter-day 70 AD 1 West ISUPK camps have come in with a, 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 a diverse philosophy, right? right? A, a kind of antagonism to our other Hebrew and Israelite people worldwide. I'm talking about some of the camps. I'm not talking about all Hebrews. I'm not talking about all Israelites. But I'm talking about some of like the One West, the ISUPK camp, One West, and the other breakaway, you know, alphabet camps, IUIC, uh, GMS, uh, GOCC, and we can go down the, the line. There's a few of them that are from that one West, that 1970 AD, 60, 67, 67, some say 69, rounded off 70 AD, right? Because are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? This is Amos 9 and 7. We also have Psalm 87, right? Verse 4. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia with Tyre, right? With Ethiopia, Im Kush, Ze Yulad Sham. This was born there. The translator says, This man was born there. Isn't this interesting? Even this verse right there, there is a prophetic of that particular verse. So the link of Ethiopia, Psalm 68, verse 31. Princes, princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to Elohim, right? To Elohim, speaking of the Elohim, El Elohe Yisrael, the true Elohim, Ha, Ha, the Ha Elohim. So here we're talking about Elohim, we're speaking about Hailehim, Ha Elohim, the Elohim, the true good, the true God. So even these verses right here make important links. Now, the academic, the scholarship knows this. There's a very good book by author Bernard Lehman, Bernard Lehman. Um, what's the name of that book? If you can remind me of the name of that book right there. Um, it's about the Sheba cycle. The Sheba cycle. I think I might have it right over here. The Sheba cycle. Right? The Sheba cycle. Hopefully, if I don't bring it out right here, we'll go through some of the books that we have available that we will highly recommend. If ones want to get into real scholarship and show how the European, right? Let me say the Anglo-American and the Western Gentile, we say the predominantly dominated the white scholarship, both white Christian and Jewish scholarship, right, have almost kind of joined hands to suppress this particular information, to suppress this important information. This is like the Holy Grail. When we talk about Ethiopia, the Ethiopia connection, right, when we say Ethiopia, we're not talking about this, just the Ethiopian, just in the general sense, but we're talking about the Israelites, the Israelites of Ethiopia, right? The Israelites of Ethiopia tradition, right? And this is another point since I'm speaking about manuscripts. Ones like Garfield would say, oh, the only Ethiopian Bible was translated in the fourth century, in the fourth century from the Septuagint. That's only half true. There was a later translation of the Bible, especially the New Testament, from the Septuagint but also from the Syriac, 
right, around that same time. Because you're talking about around, roughly around, I think, actually 500, 500 or so A.D. Where we get the nine saints. They call the nine saints of Ethiopia, right? They were fleeing persecution, right? Like the Roman, the kind of the pre-Roman Catholic persecution. They were fleeing that and they went to Ethiopia. Some say they were Gnostics. Some say they were mystics, so forth and so on. They came to Ethiopia and they had with them the Syriac, the Aramaic and Syriac. And they had the Septuagint. And so they brought that particular scholarship with them to Ethiopia and much works were translated, right, roughly after really the fourth century, really roughly around the around the fifth, fifth to sixth century, right, was there, there to be like a later translation, right, a major, a major translation. But even before that time, in Old Testament times, Ethiopia received original manuscripts because Ethiopia received 1,000 Israelites from each of the 12 tribes. That's 12,000 plus those of the priest class, right? The priest class, Azariah, Azarius, as we have it. And we have Azariah both in the scriptural text and also in the Kevra Neges, right? In the Kevra Neges, the glory of the kings. The interesting thing when we study Azar Azariah, he was the son of Zadok. You know, we hear even in the prophet Ezekiel concerning a priesthood that was known as the Zadokites. You hear a talk about the Zadok, 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 right? And the Zadokites. Well, it's interesting because during the time of Solomon, of Shlomo HaMelech, we had Zadok and we have his son Azariah. And what's interesting is when you read the, the Hebrew Bible narrative, it seems as though many ones disappear. We get a chronology of names, right? Some names, right? In the time of Solomon. But some of these individuals seem to just disappear. But then we pick up on them in the Kevrnegas. This is another proof, right? When we look at both witnesses, the Hebrew witness and the Ethiopian witness, that proves that if these people were there, Right. And then all of a sudden we don't hear about them no more. Like after Zadok, we don't hear about his son, Azariah. We hear about him initially, but we don't hear about him later on. Right. But then he shows up as one of the main priests in Ethiopia with the Levites and the Ark of the Covenant and the Israelites of Ethiopia that established a kingdom. So we as Israelites and as Hebrews from the say, Old Testament perspective had a kingdom. Right in Ethiopia, there's also the testimony, the Ethiopian documented manuscript testimony, right? Historical testimony of when Ezra and Nehemiah had returned, right? Along with certain Jews, they repatriated after the Babylonian exile when the black Jews returned to Jerusalem. And we have part of it narrated in Ezra and in Nehemiah, and then we also have the, you know, Estrus, right, the pseudepigraphal book of Estrus as well, but in the canonical scripts, we have Ezra and Nehemiah, that documents when the black Jews had returned out of Persia. So, we know at that particular time in history, they existed. We have testimony on both sides. We have testimony in the Torah, in, in the scripts, right, the Brit uh, Hayashana, what, what some might call the Tanakh or the Old, the Hebrew Bible. We prefer to stick to the Hebrew Bible, so we're in the Old Testament, right? We also have the testimony of the black Yehudi or the Jews, the Judites, the Judeans, also from the Babylonians themselves. And also in many of those cultures, Babylon and Persia. So we have testimony that these people existed roughly around the 500 time. And then as we go to the time of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, people say, oh, there was no, like Chris Harris, he tried to say, well, the Temple of Solomon, you know, didn't exist even in 70 AD time. But the Romans testified to it. This brings me to another important point right here, right? This is for the scholars so that we'll begin to be, you can hopefully discern some of these points and it can enable the I and I and I and you and me and us to be better able, you know, to, to, to address and redress. So 
speaking of he he feels solomon and the old testament none of these individuals never existed and they never you know never existed but we get testimony of these individuals we even have artifacts in fact zion lex even pointed out when one caller had called in about oh well um jerusalem you know jerusalem you know like like either never existed or the name was not known until later on and then brother zion lex he brings up one of the um what are those things called the little tablets? Um, uh, what is it called? What was the place? The place that Akhenaten, Akhen, Amarna, like tablets, these little tablets. Amarna, like tablets, right? These Amarna tablets. And, and on these tablets, it definitely calls the place Jerusalem and it speaks about the so called invasion during the time of Yehoshua right Ben Nun Joshua the son of Nun right and the Israelites you know after that sojourn in the wilderness so at various points in history right we get testimony even in ancient Egypt the, the Marenpata right even that Stella right whether it's completely accurate or not it does make mention of israel then one's gonna say well is it really talking about israel or it's not talking about israel is it's not the israel the person or it's my israel the place you know all this goofy stuff first they say that well we never existed there's no evidence we find the evidence and then making up these things okay talk about primary resources do you chris harris one like chris harris or people with that chris harris mentality right you know against we the hebrews and the israelites right well, do you believe that the Roman Empire existed? That's a question. Do you believe the Roman Empire existed? Um, do you believe that the Roman emperors and some of these uh, his histories that we hear about? See, because they always question us, well, where is the, the original paper or parchment that Moses wrote on? Because if you don't, can't show me the original paper or parchment that wrote, Moses wrote on, then Moses never wrote on it. Moses never wrote nothing. It never happened. Never existed. You know, there's more manuscripts for the Old Testament of the Bible from Old Testament B.C. times and for A.D., right, than there is for the history of the Greek and the Roman Empire. There are more manuscripts written at the time, right, and in the timeline within, we say, 30 to 50 years, right? And that's kind of pushing it, 30 to 50 years. So what they try to do is try to late date things because when they late date it, it fits in with their theory. And that makes us have to do more research, right? And then find out, you know, come to prove like, wow, we actually can prove that even people say that the New Testament wasn't written until like hundreds of years later and, and the letters of Paul wasn't written. Those are lies. Those are straight up lies. Those are lies. It's been proven. What they don't do, here's how you turn the argument, that there's more manuscripts, right, for the Hebrews and the Israelites of the Old Testament and the Yehudi and the Jews, we the black Jews of the New Testament time, than there is for the Greek and Roman history. Greek and Roman history only have a few resources. Did you know that? People always say Greek and Roman history as, as it's like a fait accompli. That's because the academic scholarship, the same scholarship that a lot of these goofy black so-called coon, conscious, conscious people be trying to dismiss the Hebrew Israelite reasoning, go to. <laughs> there's, there's more parchments, right, that prove from ancient times than there are that prove Roman, Greek, and Roman history. That's the thing that's really shocking. They don't talk about it. But the European, these scholars that they go to never talk about that because they accept what they claim to be their history. See, when the white man was claiming to be a Christian and when he was claiming to be a Jew, right? You know, you know I'm, I'm talking about really claiming these things before, you know, we had the muzzle, so to speak, off of our mouth. I, you know, the muzzle off our mouth and the chain off our hands and feet and taking the chain off of our hearts and minds, right? He was proving it every way, which way possible. But once black folks started to rise up and say, hold up, this is our story. Look, this is black and that's black. This is us. Then the scholarship started to turn. 
right? Started to be this critical scholarship. Then you even get to find a lot of ones and ones becoming less religious. Have you noticed that white people became less Christian <laughs> than he was historically speaking? Even some of the Yehudian Jews, the Jews, even the state of Israel, the European Jews, they have a tough time with their, their secular Jews. You know, but the, the, the rift between the Orthodox, the Ati, and the Heloni, the secular Jew, and the Heredi, the ultra-Orthodox, it's just bad over there. And politically and otherwise, they have all sorts of problems over there. With the same thing, right, that many of them also were responsible for elsewhere because we know of the you know the secular Jew has been very involved in liberal you know in liberal we could say liberal and even over here democratic and liberal politics as well as in the academic institution I mean we know this because a lot of the research and books that we research good bad and ugly right but a lot of them have been involved in that you know so that's the point right there now to the linguistic point we're gonna sum this up right here and then we'll try to follow up now did is Deuteronomy is Deuteronomy 2868 prophecy foretold well let's just look at the book for a moment let's go quickly right here to the book we're going to sum this up right here let's go over here let's bring up my sword my sword my sword and yes Zion we might have to refer to the strong concordance because at a first level why right, at a first level a basic level because we're trying to get our people from the King James through the King James. That's what ones are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And even Raboni, right? Robain or Yeshua Hamushia. For I and I, I and I, Rabbi, the Rabbi of Rabbis, our Black Lord and Savior, Yeshua Hanotri, right? Even he said that one who has been drinking like the old wine, he gave this like rabbinical like proverb one who has been drinking the old wine doesn't immediately want the new wine. Right. So that means that, you know, our people are going to grow gradually. So these are kind of steps. But yes, yeah, some do get stuck on this and don't go deeper. Let's go down here. And Chris Harris was saying this chapter here is about blessings and curses. Right. Blessings and curses. And he puts in the term of some vassal contract, a vassal agreement, like serfdom, like ancient serfdom, basically feudal, like ancient feudal system. And yes, basically that's so. But. If you really understand what we're talking about, it's no different than you are the landlord and you have tenants or you are the tenant and you have a landlord. You are the employer. You have employees. You are the employee. You have an employer. It's basically no different. There's some contractual agreement when you if you work for somebody else or even if you start your own business, there's paperwork, there's terms. You have to deal with the state. You have to deal with the country. You have to deal with the place that you're at. You know, make sure that, you know, all the I's are dotted, proverbially speaking, and the T's are crossed. Now, in the very we're going to prove this is to prove right here. Right, that the transatlantic, what's what's called, remember, it's Trans Ethiopian Ocean, right, Ethiopic, and we're gonna keep saying that, because ones who pick up on what we're saying and apply it to their mind and say, okay, let me think about this different. If it wasn't called the transatlantic, right, it was called the Ethiopian Ocean. So they brought these black people, the Israelites, you know, the Hebrews here from from here to there across trans what what was it then if it wasn't the southern atlantic it was the ethiopian ocean okay so let's call it what it was it was a trans ethiopian ocean slave ship but how many people would wake up how many people would just wake up <laughs> how many people would just wake up off of that think about this for a moment what we're saying right here how many people would just wake up there'll be a great awakening Especially if the colleges and the academic institutions did that, right? If some of the liberal Yehudi and Jews who are up there in these institutions and who really are about our cause, you know, that's what they need to push. Push renaming it the Trans-Ethiopian Slave Trade. Uh-oh! The Trans-Ethiopian Slave Trade. Now, you're going to get some pushback for some careless Ethiopians, right? But fluck that. Because this does not belong just to them. Because remember, on the west side of Africa, think about this moment. On the west side of what's called Africa today, it was the Ethiopian 
ocean. And then the most ancient maps that we have from prior to the enslavement period, enslavement, the slavery, enslavement period, prior to that, the continent, we have maps, it was called Ethiopia, also Ethiopia Superior, Ethiopia Inferior, Upper Ethiopia, Lower Ethiopia. We have this on a series of maps. So we know Ethiopia today is on the east, east of the River Nile, right? Ethiopia today. But if in the ancient times, the ocean on the west was called Ethiopia and the continent was called Ethiopia, then who did they really take? <laughs> who did they really kidnap? Who did they really captivate and take into captivity and into slavery? Who? Thus, now we look at the Bible again, Amos 9 and 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? So here, 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 here you go, here you go. The Atlantic Ocean was known as Ethiopian Ocean until the 19th century. Okay, repeat. Atlantic Ocean was known as Ethiopian Ocean until the 19th century. So when we say that the transatlantic slave trade never happened, never happened. And the reason why, I know that's going to shock ones. Well, how can you say that? I mean, look, could you see it written? It keeps being repeated. It's like what Joseph Goebbels said, right? Hitler and Joseph Goebbels. And then you keep repeating a lie over and over and again. And even when the truth, right, is brought forward, we're showing you here, we show this, we talked about this over 20 years ago. Finally, I think one of these um, fact checkers, fact checkers, thank you, fact checker, right? Because we was getting a lot of heat. Right over 20 years ago when we were saying these same things. It's good to know that, you know, ones are getting it, but getting it so late, you see, because ones already know the, the, not just the psychic, but the intellectual, right? The intellectual effect of this. This is like the atomic bomb. We're dropping like the atomic bomb right here. This is like the atomic bomb, right? the Trinity. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean was known as Ethiopian Ocean until the 19th century. That means that when did the so-called enslavement, enslavement, right, of black people from what they call West Africa, what they call West Africa. So this is what they do all the time. Haven't you noticed how they sometimes change, you know, terms? You ever been in like an agreement, have a contract with a company, whatever, and then all of a sudden they say, well, we're going to just change things. You're like, but, but this is not how it was. This is not what I bought into. This is the same thing here, right? You believe it was the Atlantic Ocean, but it was not. If you say, oh, that's just semantics. Is this just semantics or is this real history? This is real history. That means that when the navigators navigated, right, right Africa was called Ethiopia, and the Atlantic Ocean was called the Ethiopian or the Ethiopian Ocean. So wait, wait, hold on for a moment. That's one. One, the Atlantic Ocean, the Southern Atlantic Ocean, transatlantic, right, remember? Southern Atlantic Ocean at the time was called the Ethiopian Ocean. So it was what? At the time, it was the trans-Ethiopian Ocean slave trade, right? Old map. This is the old map here from about 1665, uh-oh, 1665. Look, let's zoom in in case they can't see it. The Ethiopian Ocean, isn't this the Gold Coast, what they call the Gold Coast? So during that 400 year period of time, this is where we came from. Now, did the Bible prophesize this? Did the Bible, in other words, is this prophecy contained in Deuteronomy, you know, 28, 68, and that chapter, is it contained anywhere else? Yes, it is. We just showed you we had Deuteronomy chapter 68, I mean chapter 28, right? We scrolled from verse 68, went back to the first verse. And in the very first verse, it says, and it shall come to pass. Isn't that like somebody saying that this is what's going to happen? Isn't that prophetic language? Isn't that prophetic language? Isn't that way like a prophecy, prophetic language? It shall come to pass. Well, it's going to be, right? It's going to be, I'm going to kick your ass. Right? It's going to come to pass that I shall kick your ass. Wait, wait, hold on for a moment. It's not happening now. It didn't happen in the past, but it shall come to pass that I'll kick your ass. That's prophetic speech. I am forth, I am foretelling. I am telling something before the time. So if it happens that I kick your ass, 
then this means that I prophesied and it came to pass. I spoke and it was. This is what happened. This is what Deuteronomy is speaking about. This is what the Torah, this is what the prophecies concern, the once lost, now found, black and brown sheep of the house of Israel. What you got amongst our people, some of the white Jews, I listen to some of the white Jews when they be having their internal arguments with their people. And sometimes they have, you know, Jews who are more secular and they call them self-hating Jews. It's interesting. You know, ones that go against, you know, Israel or their vision based on the scripture, the Bible. They call them self-hating Jews. We might have to adopt this terminology. They call us self-hating, right, if we say we're not kemetic, right, kemetic. And, and the term kemet doesn't really truly describe. Mitzrayim is more accurate and Mitzrayim does signify bondage. If you knew Hebrew, see, in, 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 in what's his name, what's his name, what's his name? Chris Harris, he said, he said um, oh, the, the word Mitzrayim is just a locative, a proper noun locative. And he went through the, strong, the, the Strong's Concordance and then he read the meanings and he read up to the word siege, siege, siege. And, and I, I was listening to see whether he would say anything and he just flew. He jetted, right? He jetted. He was like, um, um, who, who was that that tried to steal fire from the gods? <laughs> Trying to steal fire, right? Yeah, you know, right? That hubris, but Ethiopian ocean. So what does it say down here? It says old map from about 1665 showing all of what is called today Africa being called Ethiopia and the Atlantic Ocean was the Ethiopian Ocean I don't own the original it was two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars fifteen years ago you know what as much as we black people been talking about this right here this probably got to be probably it, it was like it was like two thousand over two thousand dollars then it's probably twenty two thousand dollars now if not more it should be right so we value look at that look at how what we're interested in how we get value to it so we being interested in this hebrew israelite jewish thing you can see how they'll be changing the goal posts they're changing the goalposts. I mean, how dear Chris Harris said, oh, those in Africa, they are like converts, like all of them are converts. Hmm. When did they convert? Because Brother Zion Lex said that, well, they were pre-colonial times. The testimonies of them, right, were pre-colonial times, right, from so-called Europeans, Arabs, and others was pre-colonial. So that was before the 1600s, right, 1619 to 1600s, 400 years. So at that time in the 400 years from the 16, you know, 1600s to like the, the, the 19th century, this, that, that's the epicenter of the enslavement, right? Therefore, the prophecy that we have in Amos 9 and 7, are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians to me? Think about this. If we were referring to the Atlantic Ocean as the Ethiopian Ocean, Right, the Ethiopic Ocean, the Ethiopian Ocean, and we say, yeah. Um, does Deuteronomy twenty-eight sixty-eight, right, foretell the Trans-Ethiopic Ocean slave trade, the Trans-Ethiopian Ocean slave trade, right? And we looked at the map and we saw, oh, Ethiopian Ocean, constant Ethiopia. Okay, yeah. It'll be very, very, very clear, especially when we look at our history as black people here, especially here in this North country, Judahites, so-called Negroes, here in the Americas. Here in the Americas. When I say here in the Americas, specifically from the scholarship, I'm pointing to the scholarship here in America that connected the dots, right? That made the, 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 the connection of the dots right there, there, there. One more right here, Atlantic Ocean, just, just so you, you, you'll get this for yourself. Right? Look at this map right here. Look at this map right here. You see where Ethiopia is located right here? Here, they have Ethiopia located. Right? And what does it say under, underneath? It says Ethiopia. This country is wholly unknown to the Europeans. Sorry, this is not a clear, clear um, pick here. But you can make it out. That's as large as I can zoom this in. Ethiopia, it says this country is wholly unknown. W-H-O-L-L-Y Holy, 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 holy Holy unknown to the Europeans Uh-oh So you can see when you look at the map in context 
Africa was only this part up here, Northern Africa, the area that's called, I think today, Tunisia and Libya. Tunisia and Libya, historically in parts of Algeria, was historically Africa. That's why they used to say that Egypt was not in Africa. At that time when Tunisia and Libya was known as Africa, Egypt on the map was not in Tunisia and Libya. That's what that meant. But see what happened, they changed the map, but they kept the old rhetoric. So that's how we started, black folks started to say, what do you mean Egypt is not in Africa? Egypt is in Africa, because we could see the maps where they have Egypt and they called the whole continent of those maps Africa. But at the time, at the earlier time, remember the anachronistic, a lot of this anachronistic, pseudo black conscious, pseudo scholar thinking, at the time it was called, right, Ethiopia, and the northern part, Tunisia and Libya, that's called today Tunisia and Libya, was called Africa. And that was based on the Romans. It was a Roman colony. Look over here. Over here, they call it Negro land. We have another map where we can show you this Negro land. It's called Ethiopia. Ethiopia, um, I think they say inferior or lower Ethiopia. I think they call it lower. Yeah, yeah, that's what they call it, lower. The upper part, lower Ethiopia. So you see what Negro land is right here? Because you hear a lot of Israelites saying, Negro, see, we're Negro. They call Negroes here. We're Negroes there. You see Zondervan, uh, uh, Pseudo Bible Dictionary, right? Concordance, Zondervan, Pseudo Bible. It says that, that we, the, we the Negroes, we the Israelites, not the Egyptians, not the Ethiopian, not the Ethiopian, not the what? Not the Ethiopian, not the what? Not the Ethiopians. That's a later day. That's the same thing. Zondervan is an anachronistic, it's out of time. It'd be interpreting things out of time. It doesn't interpret it in the ancient context. It'd be mixing up terms, terminology. And because the majority of the latter-day Hebrew Israelites from the One West camps have picked up on that, there's a lot of mix-up and corruption there. It's not going to be easy for ones and ones to see the truth of this. But hopefully they see the truth of this before it is too late. It doesn't take away the primary point of who we are or what we are to do. Right? It just points out the true story, the true history. So we have this map here. Right? And you see over here where it says Ethiopian. Here they call it the Ethiopian Sea. So the Ethiopian Sea is all the way over there in the West Africa. The prophecy in the Bible, are you not as the children of Ethiopians and the male children of Israel? Right? Another old map right there. Right? We, the black African Ethiopian peoples of the world. <laughs> We, the black peoples of the world, sound like the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, the preamble, right? We, the black peoples, and remember, the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, after Garvey's UNIA, was one of the first organizations to identify us as black, before black became popular in the 60s and 70s. So, it seems as though, when we have ones that are like heralds, or, or like, um, how can you say, like... Um, first proclaimers or you know like some people are just ahead right and it takes our people it seems to take our people like 40 years and this is another prophetic thing in the scripture too we can point to the 40 year period of time it takes like a whole generation right it's like when a generation is off the generation remains off the generation stays off so the ethiopian world federation incorporated right in 1937 identifying us as black people and then in the 60s and 70s black becomes beautiful black becomes popular right so black consciousness right owes a lot to the ethiopian world federation incorporated you see right here this map here can you make it out lower ethiopia under our entire you see what it says our entire under that on that map it says lower ethiopia you see on the other side that even links with central africa linking to east africa it says upper ethiopia so lower ethiopia upper ethiopia so here we see three different maps from three different periods of time with three different articulations right here over here notice this over here over here we can't make it out very clearly right here. It seems like this one is when they start to introduce the Atlantic Ocean, right? But then they have Southern something right here, right? The Southern Ocean. So they, they're renaming it right here. But you notice, even though they rename the ocean, um, it seems as though say Atlantic. We see Atlantic right there. You see on the continent, it has lower Ethiopia. Remember I just showed you Negro land, right? 
Negro land in West Africa, right? Before that, it was named Lower Ethiopia. So that means the Europeans, right, especially the ones who knew, right, and they made knowledge, you know, knowledge is power. That's where we get that particular, well, that's one of the places today we get that particular statement, and that's very important to them. So they knew this, right? And therefore, if knowledge is power, keeping you and me, I and I, ignorant to this is power. Right? Keeping I and I ignorant to this is power. So right here, 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 had just touch on that briefly right there, there, there. Right? So right here, in the opening words of Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, And it shall come to pass. Right? Right? That means it will happen. What will happen? If thou shall hearken diligently to the voice of Yahweh, Hashem, and Loheka, Jehovah, thy Elohim, thy power to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Yahweh Eloheka, that Jehovah, thy Elohim, will set thee on high above all nations. That means above all other nationalities, whether they were other black or brown people, whether they were, you know, light skinned people, you know, white people. You know, when I say yellow people, whatever other people, whatever they look like, tall, short, whatever other nations, right? Because we were called to be a kingdom of the priesthood and a kadosh goy, a goy that is kadosh, a kadosh goy, set apart, right, from all other nations, all other people. This is just explaining the Bible. We don't have to, you know, have to defend Hashem, have to defend Jah, Jehovah. All we have to do is just defend the truth, and the truth is, it is written. Right, and all these berakot, all these blessings shall come on thee. Right, these blessings, these these goodnesses, um, prosper like prospering, that which will be increased, increased. The word for blessing in Hebrew, right, breaking down from the Afro-Semitic, means to like increase. Right, it has a sense of increase. A right, and overtake thee. And if see that condition, the word, the clause is if. That means it's conditional. You know about law? So yes, this is law. Yes, this is a contract. Yes, this is an agreement. And in this law, in this contract, in this agreement is a fourth telling, right, of the barcode of the blessings and the kalalot, right, the, the, the blessings and the curses, right, that will, the consequences of the blessings, the good things, and the, the bad consequences that will happen. The good things if you listen, if you do, and the bad things if you don't do. If thou shall hearken, right? The word hearken, Hebraically, the Shema, also has a sense of like hearing, feeling, obeying, right? Like when somebody, you hear me? Yeah, 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 I feel you, I feel you. That's, that, that's what Jai is saying. You feel me? When in the, 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 the Hebrew sense of hearing. To the voice of Yahuwah Eloheka. And then it goes through the blessings, right? It goes through the blessings. We get up to chapter, I mean, verse, Sleeka. So now we get up to verse 15. I think it's verse 15 and ver verse 15. There we go. But it shall come to pass. So we get the clause, the prophetic clause is there in the very first verse, right, of Deuteronomy chapter 28, right, for the burkot, for the blessings, the goodness is, 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 is. Then in verse 15, right, of the same chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, we get the same clausative, we're higher, right, we're higher. Does it say we're higher? You know, it shall come to pass, right? It shall come to pass. Let's look at the Hebrew right here, really quick right here, right? Here we go right here. It goes to the Tanakh right here, what's called the Tanakh, right? And here we have, you see this right here? That word highlighted? We're higher. Some modern Jews with their um, Eastern European enunciation would say Vahaya, Vahaya. But in the ancient Afro-Semitic way of enunciating, we're higher, we're higher, and it shall be, we're higher. You see, it's the H 1961, the H 1961, higher, we're higher, right? To be, to become, to come to pass, to exist, to happen, to fall out, to happen, and it will happen, and it will come to pass, it will come into being, it will arise. That's why he says, he says, what, Horace on the horizon or something like that? Chris Harris? Yeah, but not rising. You're not rising. You're dead on the horizon, right? Here, Wahaya, Wahaya is the key operative word that proves 
that in the context of the language that yes, it's a contractual agreement similar to other type of contractual agreements of that particular time. Like today, if we do something for black people, pro-black, and try to uplift our people, we might take some of the best practice and the procedures that we're used to in this latter-day world, right? Even though we're doing it for black people, somebody would say, oh, you're taking the white man stuff. Take some African stuff. Take some African, some ancient African stuff. You know what I mean? You'll be like, what does it matter? We're using the best now to help our people now. This is what we have right here, right? So here we're higher. Let's go down to Strong's. We saw the BDB. The BDB gives us a little more detail, I must admit. Agree with you, Abdi Olewi, right? Here, Strong's definition, primitive root to exist, to be, to become, to come to pass. Boom. That means it will happen. It will happen. This will happen. This will happen. This will happen. And this will happen if you do this, this will happen. But it shall come to pass, will higher, im lo. If you don't hearken, if you don't hear, feel this, right? Chris Harris doesn't feel the voca, the voice, right, of Yahuwah Eloheka, right, of Yahuwah Eloheinu, right, of, of he who be, who he be, our Elohim. Hak ados, baruchu, baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be he, blessed be the name, to observe, See, science is observable, testable, repeatable. So we can apply this as science, Hebrew science. It's observable, it's testable, it's repeatable. To do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses or consequences, hear the kalala, kalala, right, shall come up on thee and overtake thee. So then when we get to the verse that they decided to discuss right here, verse 68, and Yahuwah, right, Jehovah shall bring thee into Mitzrayim again with ships by the way whereof I spake to thee. Now, if you read the Hebrew, and here's the point that Zion Lex makes very well, and, you know, even myself, we can kind of go into more of a breakdown of this, but if ones don't really understand the Hebrew, we'll have to take our time. This is why we go over some things, right, because... If one say they understand it, okay, let's back up and you explain it, right? And then when you explain it, be ready for what we do in the yeshiva, even the Rastafari yeshiva. We're going to go in on what you're saying. Not because we disagree, but because your explanation needs to be able to take the counter argument, right? Prove it, right? We can prove in the Hebrew, right, that this is prophetic. We just prove that and it shall come to pass both in verse 1 and verse 15, right, is prophecy. So we prove here that it is prophecy according to the context of the text. Now, to go into the other object lessons, right, as we say with the 10 words, the Esareta de Barin, right, the 10 words, that is the commandment. All the rest, right, all the rest is basically commentary, right? And we went through a little bit of commentary, and here, 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 to heal up to to these ones right here right this is from the isupk but you know many of us have been saying this even before right here this is our true you know this is our true holocaust is that that come from like a burnt offering a sacrifice right a living sacrifice burnt offering a sacrifice right so here 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 yes i rastafari look more check out the description check out the podcast as well Yes, I, Rastafari. Also, check us out. Hit up the contact, LOJS.org. Shalom, Chabarim. Shalom. Very good debate once again. Thank all three of y'all, you know, for that particular debate right there. But Zion Lex, you won that one right there. This is our, this is our objective p opinion, our objective perspective that Abdiel Ben Lewi, Zion Lex won that right there in explaining that it is prophecy there were some interesting points that chris harris brought out that we'll like to address on its own hopefully in a follow-up shalom habarim shalom this is yadin loj the line of judah society of his majesty yes i